Okay, so how is everyone today? Good. This is how I know we're getting close to the boundary for withdrawal rate. This is, <laughs> this is how it starts to look. So, last time uh, we were talking about the second partials test. Today is the 13th. Last time we were talking about the second partials test. We're still talking about the second partials test. Um, so just to remind you of what that's about is that in the scalar calculus case, that is to say when you were back in the old days when things were simple and you, do, you were dealing with functions that had this signature, <coughs> then uh, we had these sort of two broad categories that we liked, functions that look like this, functions that look like this. So locally, when functions look like this, this is called a local maximum, and this other one a local minimum. <coughs> So this is the highest point on that one, and this the lowest point on that one. Now, from the differential point of view, the, the fundamental idea of calculus is that locally, um, if things are differentiable, locally they, things look flat. Now, understand <coughs> that when a mathematician says flat, they don't mean horizontal. Uh, they mean flat. Like, for example, that wall is flat, but it's not horizontal. So, so these are differentiable functions, which means locally they look flat. And at the maximizer of that function, not only, do, not only is it flat, but it's also horizontal. Similarly, horizontal. So, so having a horizontal tangent is not enough to be able to distinguish between relative max and relative min. Both of these have the property uh, that the first derivative is zero. First derivative is zero there. First derivative is zero there. So what is the calculus way to distinguish between these two? Besides the slope chart. Second. second derivative. So in particular, something must be true about the second derivative for this one, and something must be true about the second derivative for this one. So what's true about the second derivative for the, for the first one? Less than 0. And for this one, more than 0. So again, the first derivative talks about the tangent line, in particular the slope of the tangent line. And the second derivative is telling you twice the leading coefficient of the tangent parabola. Okay, so the negative, negative uh, leading coefficient parabola is open down just like this. Positive leading coefficient parabola is open up just like this. And alternatively, you can put little googly eyes on this Right, and then that looks like a frowny face and a mustache. Right? Negative people are frowning. Terrific. Okay, so that's the that's the the back when when calculus was had had functions of this easy sig signature, reels to reels. So now now what is the signature of functions that we are dealing with for the second partials test? So, so what does this mean, real to real? It means you, put, you, you give a real input, like 4, and produce a real output, like 8. What is the signature for functions that, that are the subject of the second partials test? So now it's 
real squared to real. Which is to say that now there's two inputs to the function. We've been calling them x and y, but, but please understand that there's nothing <coughs> sacred about x and y. Uh, the inputs can be named anything, right? So on some of the exercises on the homework, we named them, I think, t and u or something like that. It's, ir it's irrelevant. They're names. Okay. So, again, we have this, there's sort of two things we're trying to keep track of. The first derivative being zero is saying that, that things have become horizontal. And the second derivative, that's, that's telling you uh, how things are bending, right? So then, first derivative tells you the orientation of something flat. So the first derivative of zero says horizontal. And then the second derivative tells you how it's bending. We have the same situation here. Except instead of having two categories, max and min, now we have three categories. What are their names? We still have max and min, but because we have this extra freedom, we get even another thing. What is it for the second partials test? We've got max, we've got min, and one other thing. Saddle, right? Or you can, you can achieve a saddle. So, you might have a max. Like this sombrero looking thing here. So you can make it to a max, like right here. And for this max, it is still the case that the tangent object is horizontal, but you need to understand that the tangent object is now not a, not a tangent line, it's a tangent plane. So this is horizontal. <coughs> okay. <coughs> we could also have a min. That's possible. So then, and also, at that min, the tangent plane will still be horizontal. Then the other possible surface that we could achieve for uh, <coughs> horizontal tangent plane that, that is the subject of the second partials test is a saddle. So at that point, that is the maximum of the red trajectory and the minimum of the blue trajectory. <coughs> that there is also a horizontal tangent plane there. also horizontal. Now, 
What is the condition? So for, back in the old days when this was the signature, the condition to find a horizontal tangent line was when the derivative is 0. What is the condition to find a horizontal tangent plane? What's the condition that gives a horizontal tangent plane? It's quite similar to, to this. So what's the condition? Any takers? Not, not the function, but if the function is 0, that means its height, the height of the surface, would be 0. But, but we're still going to have something 0, right? So for a horizontal tangent line, here, the derivative is 0. But here, here it's going to be all of the partials are 0. So in particular, the algebraic condition, the analytic condition, is that the x partial is 0 and the y partial is 0. So this means that you have found a horizontal tangent plane. So now, my, the question becomes, OK, this condition alone means that you found uh, probably one of these three. Then the second partials test tells you how to use the second partials to say, ah, and we found that one, or we found that one, or we found that one. So, so what do we need to use? What is the second partials test? How does, how does it tell us what to do? how to make the decision. So it's not the second it, it's not the second derivative directly, right? It couldn't be because how many how many second partials are there? 4, right? We've got to somehow use all of them. And what's the name of the thing that uses all 4 of the Second partials? We gave it a name. Well, that's what this is. The name of the, th the quantity that I'm hoping you'll say is H. Okay, and then the, its formula is the product of the pure second partials. minus the product of the mixed second partials. So we've got we've got four second partials and all of them are in a sense combined in in this equation. In this in this H. So what's true about H for this one. What's true about H here? So I'm getting like some pretty good silence here. <laughs> Usually silence means either that we're going too fast or too slow. It means that the pace is, usually means the pace is not correct. 
Now I have some pretty distinct memories of having said this last time, but it almost looks as if this is, you have no idea what I'm talking about. So, so where are we on this? <laughs> Only more silence. This is fine. I, ju I just have to, I'm just letting you know that, you know, I try and use uh, feedback from the class to adjust my presentation. But if you give me no feedback, I have no option but to press forward. So, so don't deny yourself the opportunity to speak or give input. So, so, like we said last time, a saddle occurs when H is negative. Okay. And we refer to this as the inconsistent case. Inconsistent because the concavity that you measure depends on the direction you travel. So if you travel in the red direction, you find concave down negative concavity, and if you travel in the blue direction, you find concave up, positive concavity. So that's the inconsistent case. What's true about H for a maximum? It's positive. What's true about H for a minimum? Negative is saddle. Still positive. So both of these cases, a min and a max, both have that H is positive. So this is called the consistent case. Now, the reason why this is referred to as the consistent case is because this is a max. So now I want you to imagine taking a cutting plane like this and cutting that max, cutting right through that maximum. No matter how you cut through the maximum with, with, a, vertic with a vertical plane, you're always going to see a parabola, that op a parabola looking thing that opens down, no matter how you cut it, right? It's always going to be a parabola-looking thing that opens down. Whereas this one, no matter how you cut it, cut, 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 as long as you put a vertical plane through that minimum, you're always going to see a parabola-looking thing that opens up. It's always up. So this one is always up. This one is always down. That's what's meant by the cons consistency. This is inconsistent because you cut it like this, it's concave down. You cut it like this, it's concave up inconsistent. So how do we, supposing we've established that H is positive, then how do we distinguish between these two? Positive and negative what? Well, H is positive for both of these. It's positive for a, for a for a max, it's positive for a min. Right. You pick one of the pure uh, partials. So xx is something, and xx is other something. So which one is which? So what must be true about xx for this one? Negative. And what must be true about xx for this one? Positive. OK. The reason why that's going to work is because, because this is a maximum. No matter how you cut it, it's going to be concave down. So what this is saying is that, well, let's cut it in our favorite direction, in the x direction. If, it, if it's always going to be, if it's always going to be, if it's always the same, and it's down in the x direction, then it's down in all directions. This one 
H being positive, that says it's always the same. And if it's up in the x direction, then it's up in all directions. Okay? So now let's do uh, an exercise with this. So any questions about the classification? So I, I'm just drawing it. I'm, we went over this last time, except I drew a table. I drew it with like rows and columns. Okay, for this one, I did it sort of in this pic picture way. And it's only because some people do better with tables and other people do better with pictures. In my mind, this is what it looks like. So, let's have an example. Find the critical points of the following function. classify with the second partials test. So the function is f of x and y is 3x squared plus 2y cubed minus 18xy plus 42. Okay, so the first order of business is to find the critical points, right? It says find the critical points, classify them. So now you've got to recall what a critical point is. So what's a critical point? Well, there's two kinds. They both have to do with tangency. So one of the kinds looks like this. So if this is a cone, then this cone has a critical point. Where is, where is the critical point of this cone? At the pointy place. Why is that point a critical point? It's not that. There's no, there's no tangent. No tangent plane. So in our naming of critical points, that's called the non-smooth variety. <coughs> non-smooth. Critical for lack of a tangent plane. What's the other kind of critical point? So the sombrero thingy that I keep drawing, it has a critical point. Where's its critical point? Its critical point is at the top. What's true about the tangent plane at the top? It is horizontal. So these are the 
two kinds of critical points, right? Kinds that exist because there's no tangent plane and kinds that exist because there's a horizontal tangent plane. Okay? So what is the, what is the analytic condition for this? What must be true, like equations and things like that? What, what must be true for this kind of, of critical point? I'm getting met with just stone-faced silence. <laughs> okay, I'll just keep pressing forward. So in this case, this is the case where at least one of the partials is undefined. At least one of the partials is undefined. That's what it means to have no tangent plane there. That means that in at least one direction, it doesn't look flat. That's what that means. It doesn't look flat in that direction. It looks kinked or bent or pointy or something. What's the, what's the analytic condition for this one? So for this one, it's at, at least one partial is undefined. What's true for this one? They are all defined. And furthermore, to be horizontal, what must they all be? Zero. OK. So in either case, critical points are about the partials. Okay, so then that means that in order to proceed, we'll need the partials. So let's compute them. So what's the x partial? Be 6x minus 18y. And then the y partial would be what? 6y squared minus 18x. OK, so now we need to be concerned momentarily. Are there any, are there any of this kind of critical point? Are there any of this kind? Well, it comes down to asking yourself, how about the x partial? Is there any x or y that it simply would not be permissible to plug into this formula? Like maybe, maybe this formula just couldn't suffer an 8. Like a y is 8, that would just make it blow up. No, that'd be fine, right? So as for this formula, nothing could go wrong. But the only time that th something could go wrong would be something like um, if we had a division, like if part of the formula was 5 over x, well, then x equal to 0 would not be allowed. Right? Or, or if part of the formula was like 7 divided by the square root of x. Then, then you couldn't put in x is 0. That, that wouldn't be allowed. So does everybody see that this formula, there's nothing wrong with it? How about this one? Still nothing, right? So that means that these, these are always defined. What does that mean about the kind of critical points that we expect to find? Yeah, we're only going to find some Brero points, <laughs> if you like. This is the only kind we're going to find. We're not going to find this other kind. 
Okay, so that means only this kind. Okay, so then to find this kind, the smooth kind, that means that we need to solve both partials equal to zero. We need to solve 6x minus 18y equal to zero and 6y squared minus 18x equal to zero. And I'll call this equation one and this equation two. Okay, so how can we go about solving this system? Yeah? Okay, I like, I like all of that. But just as a first order of business, so, so I agree, we're gonna take one of the equations and try to solve for a variable. So, as for that, do we, do we have a preference? Like, is equation one gonna be better always or this time? Is equation two gonna be better always or just this time or what? Yeah? I like it. The one with least resistance. I like it. So, so uh, in particular, I'm going to remark that equation one seems to be the simpler equation. But just by virtue of equation two has a square in it. Just that alone. Okay. Equation one has no squares. Equation two does have squares. So I'm going to start with equation one. So from equation one, I could take, like you say, I could put the 18y on the other side and get 6x is 18y, and then I could divide by 6 to determine that x is 3y. So what, what do I do with this x is 3y then? Yeah, I, I plug it into the other one. So if I had started with equation two, then now we'd be putting stuff into equation one. Okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that in there. So putting stuff into equation two, uh, 6y squared and then minus 18x, but we're replacing x with 3y is equal to zero. Okay, now we want to solve this equation. So what can we do? Well, we could factor out a y, right? Y is common to both terms. But we could also factor out a constant. What constant could we factor out? A six, right? So we could say that this is 6y, and then now we have to address, well, what would be inside of those parentheses if we did factor it out? So if we factored 6y out of that term, what would remain? A y, and then minus. If we factored 6y out of all that, what would remain? Not 8. Well, let's think. There'd be no y, right? And if we factored a 6 out of just the 18, what would the 18 leave behind? A 3, and then it would multiply by that 3. So what is altogether left behind? A 9. You can show more steps if that didn't work out well in your, in your own mind. <laughs> okay, so then what's the answer? What, what, what are the answers then? So what are the solutions to this equation? Nine is one of them. 
and zero is the other. So are these the critical points? Not exactly, right? Because these aren't even points, right? So it's good to know the name of the thing you're looking for. You're looking for critical points. In the input plane, this is a line and this is a line. How do we find the point that this is referring to? Yeah, we need to plug it back into something. So how about this something? So in the case that y is 0, we obtain that x is 0, plugging in y is 0. Uh, so that one of the critical points is the origin, 0, 0. And in the case that y is 9, we obtain that x is 27. So I'm going to make a, a nice error here. So then that means that one of the critical points is 9, 27. I'm just going to wait. <laughs> Is that right? Do I have that right? What's not right about it? Yeah, it should be 27.9. But wait a second. It says it says clearly. It says very clearly, nine twenty-seven. Ah, okay, good. Now that seems a little obvious, or maybe forced, or whatever, me being up here doing that. But I just want to let you know that this is not the first time I've ever taught this course, and I witness students all the time getting to this spot more or less correctly and then saying the critical point is 927. I, and, and there's a very high incidence of students doing that when it so happens that they write them in the left to right order like mm -hmm. this. The y value then the x value. So I'm just I'm pointing this out as a place where it's very common to make a silly error. So just watch it is what I'm saying. So these are the two critical points. Now we want to we want to classify them. And we're going to classify them with the second partials test, which means that we're going to need all of the second partials. So let's compute them. So the xx partial, what is it? Six, right? The yy partial, twelve y. The xy partial. So in the first place, what does that mean, xy partial? What are you supposed to do? Right. So we take the x partial, which we already have, and now we compute its y partial which is negative 18. <clears throat> and then yx, that means take the y partial and compute its x partial, and we get negative 18. And that's comforting. Why? Because these are the same. They're supposed to be the same. OK. So then for the origin, 0, 0, let's classify it. Remember that h is the product of the pure partials minus the product of the mixed partials, except the mixed partials are the same. So I'll just say that I'm going to square this one right here. OK, so then h. 
Uh, what is the xx partial at 0, 0? It's not 0. The xx partial at 0, 0. It's 6. Uh, 6. What's the yy partial at 0? It's 0. And then minus, what's the xy partial at 0, 0? Negative 18. So and we're going to square that. So that's 6 times 0, which is 0. And then minus negative 18 squared. So negative 18 is negative, but it's being squared, so it's going to be positive. So that's negative 324 is what this value is. It's negative. What does that tell us about this critical point? <clears throat> Remember, there's, there's, three, there's three conclusions. There's three exits in the second partials test. Got to remember which one is which. We have established that at the origin, H is negative. It's a saddle. Therefore, 0, 0 is a saddle. Because remember that a negative H implies an inconsistent concavity. The inconsistent kind. Okay. Then at the point 27, 9, we've got a different value of h. OK. So again, it's the pure partials product minus the mixed partials product. So what's the pure partial, the, the pure xx partial, at 27, 9? 6. Then what's the yy partial at 27, 9? One hundred eight. And then what is the xy partial at 27, 9? Negative 18. So now. That's about 600-ish, and that's about 300-ish. So this is something that's of size 600 minus something of size 300, and that's all that we need to know. I don't need to know it better than that, because what does that mean about H? It's positive. The exact value is not relevant. What that means, in a sense, it's saying that, well, it's definitely not a saddle. It's not a saddle. What it means is that it's either, it's either a max or a min. But, but as of yet, we haven't figured out which it is. So how do we how do we how do we uh, distinguish between these two? Right. So we'll say and we'll check say the xx partial at twenty seven nine. What's the xx partial at twenty seven nine? Well, it's 6, because we already did that. But what's the only thing that's significant about 6 for this purpose? That it's positive. So what's the conclusion? It's a min. Therefore, 27.9 is a min.
Wonderful. Yes? That is the YY partial at 27.9. So specifically, we plugged in x is 27 and y is 9 into this formula. Now, because it has no x's, that's just 12 times 9, which is 108. Other questions? Okay. So, so, it's a nice problem. Uh, what I want you to, among the things I want you to take away is that you've simply got to know the way the second partial's classification works. How to tell if it's a saddle or an extremal point, and then if it's an extremal point, which one is it? Is it a max or a min? You've got to be able to navigate that flow chart. Uh, another matter is that here I gave you a function that has two critical points. You should understand that that means that I could give you a function with arbitrarily many critical points. Of course, I'll never give you one with millions and millions of critical points because in the, in the first place it would be impossible to grade. Right? So, so what would be the point of me even giving it to you? But you should understand and expect that the functions that you're dealing with will have more than one critical point. Okay, they could have just one, but don't be surprised if there's more than one. Good, so any question about this? Okay, let's do one more of these before we go to something else completely different. Yeah? Uh -huh. Right. So it could, it could be like, right. So yeah, there could be any, any number of critical points. So for example, that, fun that function had two critical points. I can give you one with three. Or four or whatever. <laughs> OK. So now let's couch a problem inside of business. Okay, so here I'm going to read this out loud, and then I'll write down the relevant things. So the profit in thousands of dollars at Aunt Mildred's Metalworks <laughs> earns from producing X tons of steel and Y tons of aluminum can be approximated by the following function that's completely implausible. <laughs> no, it did, the book didn't say that part, but it's true. Uh, find the amounts of steel and aluminum that maximize the profit, and also find that maximum profit. Okay, so what I want you to imagine is that it's a business, okay? And there's, uh, they, they have two goods, or two services, or whatever. One of them is the production of steel, the other is the production of aluminum. And their profit is a function of these two variables. And they're just like every other business, they want to maximize their profit. So maybe they should produce lots of steel and a little bit of aluminum. Or maybe maybe the other way around. Or maybe they're, you know, in the end we're trying to figure out the optimal mixture. This much steel, that much aluminum. So does everybody conceptually understand the question? But besides it, you know, but I want you to see before we even get started that this goes just, it goes just fine the other way, where I could say, well, suppose we're talking about, um, you know, Bob's Banana Barn, where he sells um, Cavendish bananas and plantains. And then the question is, is well, just how many, how many Cavendish, how many tons of Cavendish, uh, and how many tons of plantain, so that cost is minimized. So instead of maximizing profit, maybe we're trying to minimize cost. Or if this was a physics class, then we could be talking about energy. Okay? So, here's the question. Is that X represents the tons of steel. Y represents the tons 
of aluminum. And P of X and Y represents the thousands of dollars in profit. So thousands in profit. Find <coughs> uh, the amounts of steel and aluminum to maximize the profit. and determine the maximum profit. And the function is thirty six XY minus X cubed. minus 8y cubed. <laughs> so now I say that this is completely implausible uh, only from physical considerations. How, how, could it <laughs> how could it possibly be <laughs> that we need to compute the product of the tons of steel and aluminum <laughs> in our profit function? It makes no sense. Okay. Fine. What should we do? Find the critical points. So we will do that. But before we do that, I want to make sure that the way forward is clear. Supposing we have found the critical points, then what? What if there's, what if there's uh, several of them? We'll, we'll test them with the second partials test, right? We'll test them. <coughs> okay. So, uh, fine. We're going to need the partials. So the X partial is 36Y. Uh, minus 3x squared. And the y partial is 36x minus 24y squared. Okay, now remember there's two kinds of critical points. What are they? Alternatively, there's two kinds of reasons that a point could be reckoned critical. They both have to do with tangency. No tangent or a horizontal tangent. Exactly. So what is the condition for there to be no tangent? At least one of them is undefined. So have a look at these formulas. Could these formulas ever go wrong? Nah, they're fine. Always defined. And that's good. That's, that means that, that the only kind of critical points we could find are the horizontal tangent kind. As a result, what we need to do is solve. Solve what? A system of equations, yeah. And and then do and then do what you were saying, yes. Thirty six Y minus three X squared 
is zero. That means that it's horizontal in the x direction. And 36x minus 24y squared is zero. And that one means that it's horizontal in the y direction. So it's horizontal if we're moving front and back, and it's horizontal if we're moving side to side. That's what those each mean. Together, it means it's horizontal in all directions. Okay, so now, this system is slightly more complicated than the previous one. Because now both equations have a square. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> but sometimes it just happens. Okay, so, so what should we do? Just pick one, okay? Which one? The first one? Okay. So we can we can get it to thirty six Y is three X squared. Right, moving the three X squared to the other side. So now do we want to solve for y or do we want to solve for x? Which one do we want to do? And for what reason? Okay. So there's kind of two bits of poison here, right? If we solve for y, then, well, we're going to have fractions. We don't like fractions, right? Fractions is scary. If we solve for y, then we're going to have 3 over 36. If we solve for x, then we won't have fractions because we'll divide 36 over 3, which is an integer. We like that. But then to solve for x, we need a radical. And it, it comes down to that which is the worst, which, which one is worse, having to deal with fractions or having to deal with radicals. And the unambiguous answer is that radicals are worse. Okay, so then we're going to go with the fractions as sad as that is. So we're going to solve for y. So what is, what is 3 over 36 simplified? 1 over 12, x squared. OK. So now what are we going to do with this information? Back into the, the equation that we didn't use, right? So we used, uh, we used equation 1. So now this information is going into equation 2. OK. So then we get 36x and then minus 24. And 1 over 12 is being squ uh, x squared is itself being squared like this. OK. So let's think about this for a minute. <coughs> um, what do you get if you square? this thing, if, if you do it. That is, that is to say, how does this simplify? Very good. OK, so then we get, we get 1 over 12 and another 1 over 12. So 1 over 12 and another 1 over 12. Uh, then x squared squared is x to 4. So this would look like. 36x minus, if you like, 24 times 1 over 144 times x to 4 equals 0. <clears throat> okay, now how does 24 over 144 cancel? Is it really? No, it is. That's nice. Uh, 36 x minus 1 6th x to 4 
zero. Okay, now what? Well, we could factor out an x, right? So we'd get x multiplied by 36 minus 1 sixth x cubed. is zero, which is not a bad position to be because now we have the product of things is equal to zero. So that means that either x is zero or 36 uh, minus 1 sixth x cubed is zero. So when you've got the product of two things equal to zero, that means at least one of them is zero. So this one's easy enough to understand, and now we can start working on this one. So we get what, 36 is 1 sixth x cubed. So now 36, that's actually 6 squared, right? And then if I multiply both sides by 6 again, then that would be uh, 6 times 36, right, is x cubed. But then either with your calculator or with your head, 6 times 36 is 6 cubed. So if 6 cubed is x cubed, then what's x? 6. One way or another. Calculator or reasoning. So, what critical is so is this is this a critical point x equal to zero? No, right? Because it's not even a point. <laughs> so it couldn't it couldn't be a critical point. So how do we get the point that's corresponding to this? Plug it into whatever looks best. How about that thing? So if x is 0, then y is 0. So we get, um, <coughs> what was I saying? Uh, 0, 0. And if x is 6, then ooh, what's that? Uh, 36 over 12, y is 3. Okay, so any question about finding these two critical points? So now, let's back up just a little bit and remember that this story is about, is about what? Mildred's Metal Works. <laughs> and we're trying to maximize profit. Now, in terms of the story, would someone please interpret that? What would that mean in terms of the story? Yeah. <laughs> That would mean that this, this is talking about doing nothing, just sh shuttering it down, sh sh shuttering up the store, nothing. Okay, this one means something else. This one means six tons of steel and three tons of aluminum. So that, that, that alone, right, that should sort of, that's not, a, that's not a proof and it's not sufficient, but that should tell you something about what you expect. What do you expect to happen? What are we looking for? We're looking for the maximizer and the maximum profit. Do you think that the maximum profit is going to occur here or here? Probably this one, right? It, now, now that, that's just because this is, a, this is a canned problem. You should understand that in the real world, that is to say in the United States, there are plenty of businesses who achieve their maximum profit by producing nothing. Okay, that happens when you subsidize 
uh, certain industries. So, for example, in the United States, it is a common and long-standing practice to subsidize agriculture. And there are a great many farmers who farm literally nothing. And they're paid to do that. Yeah? Yeah, so, yeah, there, there's, there's plenty of businesses who <laughs> their, maximum, their maximum is achieved by producing nothing. So that's only because there's regulatory issues going on, political matters. Dropping those, because this is not a political class. <clears throat> Uh, we should have the expectation that the maximum will be achieved here. So let's, let's see if that expectation is met. So let's uh, now classify. Uh, in order to classify, we'll need the, beca because we're classifying with the second partials test, sort of stands to reason that we'll need the second partials, right? More than just a clever name. So the xx partial is negative 6x. The yy partial is negative 48y. The xy mixed partial is 36. The yx mixed partial is 36. So for 0, 0, for 0, 0, what is h? Remember, it's the product of the, it's the, product of the pure partials minus the product of the mixed partials. So what is xx? evaluated at 0, 0. This thing evaluated at 0, 0. It's 0. And then not that it matters. What is yy evaluated at 0, 0? Also 0. And then what is xy evaluated at 0, 0? 36. And we're going to square that. So what's the only thing that's relevant about this h? It's negative. So what does that mean about the origin as far as its the, the conclusion of the second partial test? It's a saddle. So is that the kind of thing that we were looking for in this, in this exercise? What were we looking for? A max, right? So that, that, that's not what we were looking for. And in fact, that agrees with our, you know, with the story, right? It, it, seem, it seems implausible <laughs> in the story that you'd have a maximum profit um, producing nothing. Okay, how about at the, at 6-3, six, 6-3? Three. Six, three? Yeah, 6-3. Now our expectation is that this is going to be a max. So let's see if that's gonna work. So what is the xx partial at 6, 3? Okay. And what is the yy partial at 6, 3? That's negative 144. <laughs> And then, what is the xy partial at 6, 3? 36. OK. So I can see that these negatives cancel each other. So those can go. And this is 36 times 36. And this is 36 times something more than 36. So this one is the larger. So I don't even need a calculator to see the only thing I need to see about this h. What's true about it? It's positive. 
Does that mean it's a max? Not necessarily. What it means, in a sense, is that it's not a saddle. It could be a min or a max. We want it to be a max, so how can we confirm that it's a max? Use either pure or partial, right? Either one, whichever one you have best, easiest access to. So XX, the XX partial evaluated at 63, well, we already did that. It's negative 36, which is negative. So what does that tell us? It's a max, which is what we wanted. Now, there's one aspect of the exercise that we haven't met yet, that we haven't satisfied. What is it? So what, what does that mean about, what does that mean about, what, what do 6-3 mean? Mm -hmm. It means that, it means that to, to generate the maximum possible profit, that's going to occur at six tons of steel and three tons of aluminum. That's when it's going to occur. But what has not yet been answered? The actual maximum profit. Okay. So as a conclusion, conclusion. is that max profit at six tons of steel and three tons of aluminum. And what is the actual maximum profit? How do you figure it out? Very good. And max profit is P of 6.3. So now we need to plug that in. Okay. 36 times 6 times 3 minus 6 cubed minus 8 times 3 cubed. 216. So what does that mean about the profit? Um, what is the profit then? 216,000. It doesn't sound quite right. <laughs> for that much for that much metals. They're not they're not that I mean, you just take, just take a real super fancy car that's made mostly out of aluminum, like a Tesla. It's $100,000. Yeah, yeah, you know, like it's I guess, yeah. Or we could just go with, with that this, this problem is entirely fictional and just made up. Yeah. <laughs> or, or that. <laughs> okay, so any question about this? Yeah? There are still methods to go about it, but we do not cover them in this class. Uh, well, what it comes down to is that you still find the stationary points. That is to say, you find where all partials are simultaneously zero. And then you deal with something called the Hessian matrix, which is why I'm calling the, the classifier H for Hessian. And then you have to check whether or not the Hess Hessian is positive definite, negative definite, or indefinite to determine whether or not it's, uh, if it's positive definite, it'll be a min, negative definite, it'll be a max, and if it's indefinite, it'll be a saddle. But that requires to be able to be able to make that to be able to do that you have to take a course called linear algebra. Which we don't have. Other questions?
Okay, so now, so these, these were called um, optimization problems because you're trying to find the input that produces the, the optimal output, the maximal output or the minimal output. So now we're in section 9.4, which is also an optimization, which is also about an optimization problem, uh, but it's more complicated. So this is called uh, the method of Lagrange multipliers. So there was a person who lived back in the day, method of Lagrange multipliers. Uh, and he, he's a French person, and that's, that's his name. And I make no warranty yet to, that I'm pronouncing it correctly. <laughs> So, here's a question. Uh, what's the tallest mountain? So, I'm asking you an op optimization question. Among, among the mountains, which one is the tallest? So, how about it? Which one is the tallest? <laughs> Everest? Okay, so that's a common answer, Everest. Okay. Um, so, in fact, it's, it's not the tallest mountain. It's not the ta it's not, uh, in fact, I can think of another tallest mountain, another, another mountain that's even taller, like a lot taller. There's a, there's a mountain called Mons Olympus, and where is it's it? On it's on Mars, right? <laughs> Right? It's on Mars. It's so big that it literally, its peak is like literally in space. Just about. Like the, at the atmosphere in Mars is already pretty thin. But the peak of Mons Olympus is so high that you're essentially in space. <laughs> it's enormous. Okay, so to make, to make sure that we don't get that answer, I guess I'll modify my question to say, what is the tallest mountain on Earth? Okay, so does everybody see that I've modified the question? I put a constraint on it. Okay, so so what? So so I'll ask again. What's the tallest mountain on Earth? Everest. It actually is. Everest is part of the Himalayas. The tallest mountain on Earth is. Most people would say not actually a mountain. The tallest mountain on Earth is Hawaii. <laughs> if you count, if you count it from the seafloor, right? Because <laughs> because it goes all the way up from the seafloor, and then even past. Okay, so now let so so most people would object. They say no, it's not even a mountain. Okay, so then what is the tallest mountain? on Earth that is a consequence of the collision of two tectonic plates. Mount Everest. <laughs> now, now, that's, now we've got it, okay? So does everybody see that the question, the question had to be constrained? Right? We're, not, we're not talking about the tallest mountain in the solar system, no, we're talking about on Earth. And no, we're not talking about uh, volcanic islands that are in the middle of plates. Those are islands, we're not even talking about that, right? We're talking about <laughs> mountains, okay? So now it's the same thing. We wanna find, find the largest and smallest points of a function, except we're going to insist that you're not allowed to look anywhere, you've gotta look in these places, okay? So does everybody see how the problem is slightly different? The previous problem, find the maximum profit, we didn't say anything about it, right? We didn't, say, we didn't say any constraint about how much steel or how much aluminum, no constraint about it. So now we're gonna start making constraints. So to kind of give you a picture, it could be like, well, suppose that I draw the sombrero one more time. 
And then we say, well, the tallest, the highest point on the sombrero is right there. That's the highest point. But then suppose that I say, uh, I'm going to change it to be green. Suppose that I, if I were to ask, what's the tallest point on the sombrero, the answer would be that point. If I were to change the exercise and say, well, um, <clears throat> suppose that you're only allowed to be on this particular trajectory, you're only allowed mm -hmm. to be on this red, then what's the tallest point on the sombrero that's also on the red? So like this one, right? It's, it's kind of tall, but it didn't make it up to the highest point. But that is the highest point on the red. Okay. <clears throat> now here's a, another way to look at it. So I'm drawing a bit of plane. So that's a that's a that's a piece of plane and it's just a piece of it. I have to whenever you draw planes and things like that, you can only draw part of it because if I drew all of it, it would just fill up the whole page, right? So this is just part of it. Um, <clears throat> I want you to imagine uh, the following. So this is the plane of the floor. Okay, and I'd like for you to imagine that side to side underneath my feet is a, a bar, an axis, on which I have the ability to rotate the floor. Okay, so then I want you to imagine that I take the floor and rotate it under my feet and tilt it down so that now it's slanted. So will my elevation change if I walk in this direction? No, no right? I don't, I don't go up and down at all. Okay. So now I want you to imagine, so, but, but my elevation, because I, because I sloped it down like this, if I move forward, I'll go down. Okay. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna move forward until I go down, my elevation goes down one meter. So, blah, blah, blah. So now imagine that I, I was formerly one meter higher. So now, will my elevation change if I go side to side? No, no it won't. So that I'm, because there's no slope in this direction. It's only in the front and back direction. So what I want you to imagine is that if, if that first one was 10 meters tall, if we said that, that's me at 10 meter elevation, this would be me at 9 meter elevation. And in fact, this whole line going that way, I'd always be at nine meters. Nine meters any time I'm going side to side like this. Okay, so I could like I could draw a line and say any anytime I'm on this line, that's nine meters. Then I can move forward more to eight meters, and then all of that would be eight meters. So we could delineate this. So what I taking that in mind what I'm saying is that this line on the plane, that's all the same elevation. These are all the same elevation, same elevation, same elevation, same elevation, getting bigger. These are all the same, getting bigger. These are all the same, getting bigger. These are all the same, etc. So, what I want you to see is that this is like walking up the plane. If this were 10 meters, the 10 meter elevation mark, this would be like 9, and then 8, and then 7, 6, 5, 4. And the plane is infinite, I'm just drawing that piece of it. It, it, it continues going. So now, for this infinite plane, is there a maximum value, a maximum elevation you can get to on that plane? 
There isn't, right? Even though, even though I've drawn just part of it, remember, it goes on forever. So, you know, here you are, say, at 7. Could you get to 8? Yeah. And then you could get to 9. And then you could get to 10. And then, well, with enough steps, you could get to 10 million, right? It just keeps going. Furthermore, it, you could get as low as you want, right? Eventually, it's going to get negative and go, and go as far negative as you want. So does everybody see that this plane has no highest point and no lowest point? Okay. Now I'm going to change, now I'm going to change the question a little bit. And I'm going to say, well, suppose that I say you're allowed to walk on the plane, but you must remain on this ellipse. So you're, you're not allowed to leave the red. So now, if you're, if you're not allowed to leave the red, is there a highest elevation that you can achieve? There is. There is a highest elevation, and it's 10. And there is a lowest elevation that you're able to achieve, and it's 4. So does everybody see that even though the plane itself does not have a maximum elevation, this new problem that I'm saying you're allowed to walk around on the plane, but you've got to be on the red. That does have a maximum. Okay, that's like... <laughs> it's, it's like me saying, what's the highest mountain? And then someone says, Mons Olympus. And then I say, okay, okay. What's the highest mountain on Earth? <laughs> to say that you've got you've to be on the red. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to characterize how will we know so the question is, is how will we know when we're at an optimal point? How will we know? Okay, so all that we're allowed to use is our calculus sense. So, so specifically what I mean is that this problem that I've described is simple enough to, and, and human beings are advanced enough where you can just look straight at the problem and say 10 is the maximum you could possibly achieve and the answer is right there. <laughs> but from a calculus point of view, how can you tell that you're at the optimal point? <coughs> is my question. Okay, so remember the calculus point of view is that you have to imagine that you're, you're, you're on this thing and you're extremely small. So maybe we're like right here. Maybe we're right there and that's all we can see. So in particular we can't see that best point right there. Right now, we have like the, the God's eye point of view, where we can say, that's the best point. It's right there. I can see it. But we're imagining the calculus point of view where you're really close and you can't see it. Okay. <clears throat> well, let's look at it really close in the calculus sense. So I'm going to draw my, my metaphorical calculus eyeball. So we're looking really close there. What would it look like to us? to be there. Well, the green is flat because, because the elevation marks on a plane are just flat. So the green's flat. But how would the red look from a calculus point of view? And remember, the calculus point of view is that if things are smooth, and if you're small enough, then they look flat, right? That's the fundamental idea of one half of calculus, is that if you can get close enough to something, then it looks flat. The red would look like this. It too would look flat. 
And that's all you'd be able to see if you were a little bitty ant creature. Now, you're allowed to move on the red. So we're right here. What would happen if you moved to the right? Would you increase or decrease your elevation? If you're right here and you moved that direction along the red, would you increase or decrease? You'd increase. And furthermore, uh, if you were to go the other direction, you'd decrease. So you can see, ignoring all of that, just from right here, you'd be able to increase your elevation going that way, and you'd be able to decrease your elevation going that way. So this couldn't possibly be an optimal point, because you'd be able to go up or down. That point couldn't be optimal. Let's look at this point. Again, with through the lens of the calculus eyeball, right? So the green would still look flat because it is flat. And the red, because, because an ellipse is smooth, the red starts to look flat when you zoom in close enough. But how will the red look? What does the flat approximation of the red look like right there? So what I'm saying is that that bit looks like that. What does the red look like right here? Sorry? Well, what, what does the tangent line to the red look like? It looks just like the green line. It looks like that. Just like if we were to transport to Kansas right now, and it was daytime, <laughs> and we could see. It would just, it just looks so flat. It looks flat. If you were a teeny tiny creature on this ellipse, that's how it would look to you right there. So now, look at this red. The red is the direction you can travel. Would you be able to increase your elevation if you traveled that way? No, because that green line is constant elevation. That's elevation 10. You would not be able to increase your elevation going that way. Would you be able to increase your elevation going that, the, the other way? You wouldn't be able to. This is what it means to be in an optimal point, is that you couldn't, you couldn't go left to get higher. You couldn't go right to get higher. It's sort of a trivial statement to say, how can you tell when you're at the top of a mountain? Well, <laughs> you're at the top of the mountain when every, every step that you take makes you go down, right? <laughs> when there's nothing more that you could do. Alternatively, where's the point on the earth where every direction is north? That's the, dire that's the point on the earth where every direction is south. Right, right? When you're at the North Pole, every direction is south. <laughs> right? South. <laughs> okay. So when these are parallel, when these are parallel, <clears throat> there that's telling you that you're at an optimal point. or a potentially optimal point, really. These non-parallel, that means that you're not optimal. So that's how we're going to tell. We'll be able to tell when we're, when we're at the right place when the objective green 
is parallel to the constraint red when they're parallel. Okay, so now let's get it worked out. So this remark is called the method of Lagrange multipliers. So from now on, I'm just going to write MLM because that's too much to write with my hand. I'll type it when I'm at the computer. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, so suppose that we have the objective function f of x and y. So now, so that you have a model in mind for for what I mean by this, this is something like profit. So in mathematical modeling, your objective function is something that you want to maximize. So a very typical problem is to say, our objective is profit and we want to maximize it. Or our objective is cost and we want to minimize it, or whatever. So suppose we have an objective function f and a constraint function g of x and y for constraint g of x and y equal 0. So that's a little bit opaque statement, but I'll, it'll become clear in a minute. We'll define the Lagrange function capital L. So now we're calling this function capital L because it's called the Lagrange function and well that starts with L. That's why we're calling it L. So what are what variables uh, are the input variables for F? X and Y, right? So Lagrange is also going to have these X and Y but it's going to have one more and the name for that variable is lambda. So I ask you, please, don't panic at the introduction of letter lambda. Uh, so lambda, in the first place, is a letter. But it's not one of our letters. Right? It's not in the English alphabet. What alphabet is it from? Greek. Greek. And what is the English phonetic equivalent, equivalent of Greek lambda? That is to say, what, what English letter makes the same sound? L. So the reason, <laughs> the reason why we're, we're choosing lambda, well, is because it makes the L sound. And the guy's name is Lagrange. That's it. That's the only reason. There's nothing magical about Greek letters. OK. <clears throat> So here's the Lagrange function. It's f of x and y minus lambda multiplied by g of x and y. So it's the objective minus lambda times the constraint. Okay, so then the critical points. L 
and this is assuming the critical points are all smooth, what does that mean? Smooth. Sorry? Yeah, that means that all the partials are defined. The critical, critical points of L are... So, how do we find the critical points of L? What are we supposed to do? So how do we find the critical... Ba back 20 minutes ago when we were talking about the critical points of F, the smooth critical points of F, what was the condition? And they're, they're all supposed to be equal to zero. So that is the same case with L. The critical points of F are when both partials are zero. Okay. Now, how many partials does L have? Three. Why does it have three? Because it has three variables. F has two partials because it has two variables. L has three partials because it has three variables. If I somehow gave you an equation with 47 variables, uh, a function with 47 variables, it would have 47 partials. So L has three partials exactly and only because it has three variables. Okay. So uh, let's do it. Mm, we'll need to compute the partials of L. <clears throat> so what is the X partial of L? Well, that means we'll need to compute the x partial of this and the x partial of that. But the x partial of f is, well, it's just that minus. And then what's the x partial of this? I don't understand why, what you mean by that. So lambda. In particular, because we're computing the x partial, lambda is just a constant. So you can imagine for the moment that lambda is like a 5. So it would be lambda times the x partial of g. Because the lambda is just a constant. OK, what is the y partial of the Lagrange function. Finally, what is the lambda partial of L? So what's the lambda partial of this term? It'd be 0. Right. So 0 and then minus. Now, what's the lambda partial of all this? Just g of x and y, right? So then we're, we're differentiating this thing with respect to lambda. This g thing is just a constant, so with respect to lambda, because so it would be like me asking, 
what is, what is the derivative of 10 lambda with respect to lambda? It's 10. What's the derivative of 9 lambda <laughs> with respect to lambda? 9. What's the derivative of g of x and y lambda with respect to lambda? g of x and y. So the critical points are when, when all of this is 0. So <clears throat> that means when the first one is 0, so the x partial of f minus lambda <coughs> x partial of g is 0. And the one, uh, oops. The y partial of f minus lambda times the <coughs> y partial of g. And then uh, negative g of x and y is 0. So now I'm going to simplify this just a little bit. This is a system of equations. I'm going to simplify it just a little bit by doing the following. For the first equation, for the first equation, I'm going to move the lambda g the lambda g stuff over to the other side so that it looks like the x partial is lambda times the other x partial like this. And the same thing for the second equation. So for the first two equations, I just move the lambda stuff to the other side. And then for the last equation, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to multiply both sides by negative 1. So the left-hand side is this. And then what is 0 multiplied by negative 1? 0. So this right here, this right here, of all of this, <laughs> of all of this stuff, this is what I need you to memorize. So the solutions to this system of equations are called critical points of the Lagrange problem. When we're doing problems from this section, more or less, mechanically, what it comes down to is solving that system of equations. Now, um, you, can, you can get really far in the exercises in this class, anyway, by just, by just memorizing that system of equations and being able to do it. But it would be sad for me if you didn't understand what they mean. So if you look at the, the picture I tried to draw to motivate you um, to, for why things are the way they are. So you'll n we came to the conclusion that if the red is not parallel to the green, then that must not be an optimal point. Because if you have to stay on the red, in this case, you could go that way and you'd go up if, you, if that was what you were interested in, finding maxima. 
Uh, alternatively, if you wanted to find minima and you were there, then you could go that way on the red and you could go down. Okay. Whereas in the parallel case, uh, if you're only allowed to travel on the red, then there's no way you can go uphill or downhill. So that, that's how you tell you're at an optimal position. So now this system of equations, I'll color code it for you. This stuff is telling you about the green lines in that picture. These two are telling you about the green lines in that picture. These are telling you about the red, uh, the red curve in the end, the red curve in the picture. But in the calculus point of view, they're telling you about these, the flat approximations of it, of the red curve. And the fact that the green is a multiple lambda of the red, when, this, when these two equations are true at the same time, When those are true, what that means is that red and green have become parallel when those are true. That's what that means. And then this, this equation, this other one, just means that you're actually on the constraint. Which means that you didn't actually, you didn't actually wander off of that circle <laughs> somehow and get, get lost. So the, the, first, the first ones mean that you've, you've reached the parallel condition, and the, the last one means that, and, and furthermore, you haven't left the constraint. So that's why this system of equations is going to end up solving this problem. Okay, so now let's solve one. So any question about this? Now I'll have to admit that some of this is a little bit unmotivated, like more or less right here at this position, I just pulled a rabbit out of a hat from your point of view. <laughs> so here's where the rabbit came out of the hat. This is my artist's impression of a rabbit coming out of a hat. Okay, now I promise you that there's perfectly good reasons. Uh, I'm just not able to give you really excellent reasons in Math 1326. Okay, so let's solve some exercises. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> So, for example, um, find the minimum value of f of x and y is 5x squared plus 6y squared minus xy. And then subject to x plus 2y is 24. Now, We've done two optimization sections right after another. Right. The main topic of the last section was second partials test. The main topic of this section is the method of Lagrange multipliers. Both of them say find the minimum or the maximum of whatever. Okay, so then <clears throat> um, what I want to point out is how do you tell where you are? How do you tell if you're on a second partials test question? or if you're on a method of Lagrange multipliers question. 
<laughs> well, the surest way is if the, if, is if the question literally says method of Lagrange multipliers. That, that's, that's cut and dried. Okay, similarly, if it says second partials test, okay, well, that's, it could mean anything else. But if it's unclear, if it's unclear, one of the, one of the code phrases is that if you see this subject to, when you see subject to, that means that we're talking about the method of Lagrange multipliers. Okay, so that's like a key phrase. Okay, <clears throat> now before we actually solve this, I want to make sure that you understand what in the end is being asked. Uh, not that you need to know, but if you were to plot f of x and y, it is a, um, it's, it's a parabola, a parabolic dish, like a bowl. And if you were to cut it, it would have an elliptical cross section. So this is like a, a bowl, is what this is. And you can imagine that a, a sort of easy way to find uh, the minimum of a, of a bowl, or like a swimming pool, is just to pour some water in it and watch where it goes, right? <laughs> you, could, you could do it like that. But now we're saying subject to a certain constraint. So now the water just can't go anywhere. So what this question is asking, it's saying that, well, imagine you have a bowl. Imagine you have a bowl. And furthermore, imagine that you cut it with, with this plane right here. So you, you kind of cut it right there. And now my question is, is on that cut, what's the lowest place you can get to? So I'm only so, I'm only so much of an artist. Right? So, you, so some, I, so a lot of this I'm just going to have to rely on you filling in the details. So that right there, that point is the bottom of the bowl. Are we going to be able to get to the bottom of the bowl if we stay on that cut of the plane? No, we won't. We're going to be able to get like right there. So can you see visually, I hope, what the question is requesting of you? Okay. So in order to proceed, we need to, with the method of Lagrange multipliers, we need to uh, figure out what the objective and what the constraint function is. So what's the, what's the objective function? And I'm not, I don't require you to draw a picture in these exercises. I'm just drawing the picture so that you have something to look at. So what's the objective function? Very good. f of x and y is 5x squared uh, plus 6y squared minus xy. Now, what's the constraint? And notably, the constraint is a function. Okay, that's a, it, it's, it definitely has something to do with that, but the statement x plus 2y equal 24 is not a function, that's an equation. So how are we going to get, how are we going to extract from the story, or, 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 or anyway, the statement of the problem, what we need? Do what? 
Uh, that won't work. So, so like solve for x, it won't work. So we need, we need in the end, we need to be able to say g of x and y is something or other. And what we'll need is that we'll need for it to be true that g of x and y equal to 0 is the same as this. So what can we say g of x and y is equal to? So that when g of x and y is 0, it's the same as that. It's really easier than you think. Well, you could take this equation and you could play with it just a little bit so that one of the sides is zero. How about x plus 2y minus 24. So notice that when you say when g of x and y is this and if you say that that's equal to 0, that's the same as that equation. Right, so the basic idea is that you just take whatever equation it was that I gave you and just move all the stuff to one side, whichever, and go. It doesn't matter which direction you go, right? I could have moved the, I could have moved x and two y to the other side. That'd be fine too. Okay. <clears throat> so what's the what is the uh, system, the Lagrange system, that we need to solve? So in the first place, how many equations does it have? Three. And remember, it's, it's of the form. The partial of the objective is lambda times partial of the constraint. So what's the x partial of the objective? minus y, and this should be equal to lambda multiplied by, what is the, um, what is the x partial of the constraint? Now, what's the y partial of the objective? Very good, 12y minus x. And this should be equal to lambda times the y partial of the constraint. What's the y partial of the constraint? 2. And then what's the last equation? the constraint. It sort of, it, it may help you to remember what each little bit means. These first equations mean that you've reached the optimal parallel condition. That's what these mean. What does the last one mean? That you're still on the constraint. That's what it means. So you've reached the parallelness and you didn't leave the constraint. OK. So now we want to solve this. We want to solve this. <clears throat> so I'll number these, which is in the, in the same style that we're accustomed to. Now, um, 
when you're doing method of Lagrange multipliers exercises, formerly we sort of just which, whichever whichever variable seemed easiest to solve for, that's what we did first. If it happened to be x, okay x. If it happened to be y, okay y. Now, on Lagrange problems, it is always going to be in your interest to solve for lambda first. Okay, so that should you should just take that as your strategy. And we're going to do so. We're going to do lambda first. So of the, of the three possible equations, which one seems easiest to solve for lambda? Probably the first one, right? <laughs> Since it already works. Let's go from one. We can obtain that lambda is 10x minus y. What can we do with this information? Yeah, plug it in. We'll plug it into the second one, since it has a lambda. Okay, that'll tell us, so into two gives us that 12y minus x is two lambda, so two times 10x minus y. And then we can simplify this a little bit. Uh, so 12y minus x is 20x uh, minus 2y. And so now I guess I'll put all the y's on the left and all the x's on the right. So if I do that, then I get 14y is 21x. Okay, so now from here, I'm eventually going to need to use the third equation. But before I do that, I should solve for either x or y. So which one do you want to solve for? Okay, solve for x. So then uh, 14 over 21 y is x. And then that's what, 2 over 3? So what can I do with that? Yeah, I can now put this into equation three, say. Okay, so x can be replaced with two thirds y. So then two thirds y plus 2y is 24. <laughs> well, 2 thirds and this 2, well, that's 6 thirds, right? So altogether, this is 8 thirds. y is 24. <clears throat> so how can we solve for y? Uh, right. 3 eighths, right? So then multiply both sides by 3 eighths. Uh, that would give us, what, 9? Okay, so we've determined that y is 9. Now what? Yeah, now we, now we can take this. that tells us that x is 
2 thirds of 9, so that's 6. Uh, and therefore, I guess the critical point is 6 comma 9. So has that, has that answered the question? So what were we, what were we we requested to do? <coughs> Find the minimal value, right? Have we found the minimal value? Alternatively, what have we found? I mean, we found the point six comma nine. What is it? Right. This is, this is the place where the minimum will occur, but it's not the minimum value. Right? It's just like, it, it's, it's analogous to, 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 to the question that was uh, several minutes ago, when the answer was to, to find the maximum profit, to obtain the maximum profit, you need six tons of steel and three tons of aluminum. But that doesn't tell you what the maximum profit is. So, we can make our conclusion now and say, therefore, the minimal value is <coughs> f of input 6, 9. And that gives us something. What is it? It is uh, 5 times 6 squared plus 6 times 9 squared minus 6 times 9, 612. OK, interesting. So that's the answer to the question. Now, uh, I do want to make a note about this. In this class, <laughs> when you're instructed to find a min or a max, of a function that has this signature, you may assume that it exists. So what I mean by that is that, strictly speaking, what we did in this exercise is we found a critical point. We found a critical point. And then we just assumed that that is the minimum that we were looking for. Okay, and I'm, I'm telling you that that is a legitimate practice in Math 1326. However, you should know that in the wide world it is not a legitimate practice because, generally speaking, critical points could be anything. We may have just accidentally found a maximum when we intended to find a minimum. But what I'm telling you is that in this class when I say I want you to find a minimum uh, and you're using the method of Lagrange multipliers, you can assume that the minimum exists. Now, what if we had done this problem and there were, say, three critical points? Then how do you determine which one is the minimum? Yeah, plug them all in. Maybe one of them is 300, and one of them is 500, and one of them is 200. Well, the one that gives you the smallest value is the minimum. Similar things about maximum. 
So that being said, I want to be, I want to restate what I already said, but try to make it more clear. You may find yourself one day uh, as the proprietor of a business or a professional working in and dealing with a lot of money. And it may be your idea or the owner's idea to say, well, I want you to find the maximum of this business situation, maybe profit. It would be really important for you to be able to say, you know, I considered that problem of finding the maximum, and I actually determined that there isn't a maximum. There isn't one. It's unbounded. It's very important to be able to know whether or not something exists before you set out <laughs> and spend a lot of effort trying to find it. Okay, which is, which is one of the best things about going camping with people who don't go camping often. Because <laughs> you can take them camping and then on like the second or third night you can say, come on, we're going to go, we're going to go catch a scree. There's all kinds of screes in, the, in these woods. And of course there is no such thing as a scree, but that doesn't matter because you can just lead them on a wonderful scree chase. Okay, with flashlights and nets and all kinds of stuff, right? It'd be terrific if that person knew that there was no such thing. <laughs> what I'm telling you is that I'm not taking you on such a hunt in this class. Okay, but you should know that in the wide world it's important to be able to tell whether or not something exists before you go looking for it. <laughs> okay, so that's all the time we have for tonight. So have a nice, uh, have a nice weekend.